Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be doing another Kahoot, and I'm going to be going over gastritis. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it, so go ahead and give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews, one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, and consultation sessions. If you're currently in a nursing program and you're struggling or you just need that extra push, I have plenty of audio lessons also available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Gastritis. First question. So inflammation of the gastric mucosa is known as, now this is an easy one, guys. Everyone should get it inflammation of the gastric mucosa is it GERD is it gastritis is it achalasia or diarrhea what is inflammation of the gastric mucosa if you're on the live and didn't make it into the class go ahead and just type your answer very good gastritis how did four of you choose a GERD so GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease and this is where the gastric content specifically hydrochloric acid that's supposed to stay in your stomach because that's what um dissolves the food right it creeps from your stomach and creeps up the esophagus and they causes a burning sensation that is GERD but inflammation of the actual gastric mucosa that is what is known as gastritis no one chose achalasia achalasia is where peristalsis of that lower two-thirds of the esophagus is completely absent and you guys all know what diarrhea is so for uh inflammation of gastric mucosa that is gastritis true or false NSAIDs, including aspirin and corticosteroids, inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins. Is this true or is this false? What do you guys think? It's true. This is absolutely true. And so let me explain this to you. NSAIDs, aspirin, corticosteroids, all of those, they actually they absolutely do inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins. And why is that important? What's the significance of that? Guess what? Prostaglandins is what causes um uh, protection of that uh gastric mucosa. That's what protects the stomach. So guess what? Without the prostaglandin, guess what's not protected? That gastric mucosa. And boom, before you know it, gastritis. Okay, so that is true. Select all that applies. And said related gastritis is associated with many drugs, including what? Select all that applies. So what are the drugs that NSAID related gastritis is associated with? Here are the choices. Paroxicam, naproxen, uh, naproxen, indomethacin, diclofenac, ibuprofen, and omeprazole. Those are your choices. Select all that applies. NSAID-related gastritis is associated with which drugs? Very good. As Belfam Coyle said on the live, all of the choices except for purple. So paroxicam, naproxen, endomethacin, diclofenac, ibuprofen, all of these are NSAID can cause NSAID-related gastritis, but not omeprazole. Omeprazole is a PPI. This is a drug that is often um, ordered for a patient who has something like what? GERD. We have another select all that applies. What are the 
risk factors for NSAID-induced gastritis, risk factors, select all that applies. Here are the choices. Being male, being under the age of 60, having a history of ulcer disease, having a history of the use of anticoagulants, history of chronic debilitating disorder, or history of the use of digoxin. What are the risk factors for NSAID-induced gastritis? Those of you that couldn't join the, the room, go ahead, put your answers on the live. Let me see your answers. Okay, so the correct answer is having a history of ulcer disease that will place you at risk for uh, NSAID induced gastritis. And we already know what type of NSAIDs can cause um, that type of gastritis. Use of anticoagulants such as Coumadin. History of chronic debilitating disorders such as what? Cardiovascular disease and use of digoxin. Let me take a step further. Not only digoxin, another um, medication, if a patient's been known to have a history of taking that medication that can cause uh, and said induce gastritis. Also, um, it's a biophosphate, Fosamax. Fosamax, I don't know if I've taught you guys on Fosamax before, but this uh, medication is very, 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 very hard on the stomach, but even more hard on um, the, it, the inner line, the protective line of the, esophag of the esophagus. Right. So after you take a medication such as Fosamax, you have to sit up. You can't lie down because you cannot afford for that medication to creep back up into the esophagus. OK, so, yep, digoxin, debilitating, chronic debilitating disorders such as cardiovascular disease, use of anticoagulants such as Coumadin, having a history of ulcer disease such as peptic ulcer disease, but not the first two. Let's talk about why not the first two. Being male, that's not a risk factor, but being female is. Professor D, do I need to know that? Yes, you do. And also being under the age of 60, that's not a risk factor, but being over the age of 60 absolutely is a risk factor. Select all that applies. What other factors can contribute to the development of gastritis? Select all that applies. Here's the choices. Let me go ahead and move this for you. Alcohol, spicy foods, foods high in fat content, carbonated beverages, citrus fruits, carrots. What other factors can contribute to the development of gastritis? Again, your choices are alcohol, spicy foods, foods high in fat content, carbonated beverages, citrus fruits, and carrots. Okay, you guys did wonderful. Everyone on the live as well. On the live, everyone's saying everything except for purple. Yep. So alcohol absolutely can contribute to the development of gastritis, and it can also contribute to what? Internal bleeding, hemorrhage, spicy foods, foods high in fat content, carbonated beverages such as colas, citrus fruits, and something I didn't add on there, but um, NCLEX has been known to have this on there as an option. So you need to know that chocolate, chocolate also can contribute to the development of gastritis. So don't say I didn't warn you, but no on carrots. Select all that applies. I'm killing you with select all that applies tonight. Which is not a clinical manifestation of acute gastritis. Select all that apply. 
epigastric tenderness, hypotension, hypertension, anorexia, nausea, vomiting. So which is not a clinical manifestation of acute gastritis? What do you guys say? Belfam Creole, you're on a roll. You've been answering everything correct so far. Good job. All right. Hypotension and hypertension, those are the only two that are not clinical manifestations. All of the other choices are them having that epigastric tenderness, that pain, um, anorexia. They don't want to eat because of the pain, nausea, vomiting. All of those are signs and symptoms. Select all that applies. Which microorganisms are known to cause gastritis? Select all that apply. Helicobacter pylori, Mycobacterium species, species, I can't speak, species, Salmonella organisms, Staphylococcus organisms, Cytomegalovirus, syphilis. I'm not going to repeat those, but which microorganisms are known to cause gastritis? Select all that apply. This is a select that all that applies. All of them, including syphilis. Only two people chose syphilis, every single one of them. Now, before I move on to the next slide, out of all of these microorganisms, which microorganism is the most common culprit, the most common cause of gastritis out of these choices? What do you guys say on the live? Type it in or the color. What do you guys say? That's right, H. pylori, by far. Even though all of these microorganisms can cause gastritis, they've been known to ca cause gastritis, by far the leading cause, the leading agent is H. pylori, the hel helicobacter pylori. Very good. If a patient has chronic gastritis, it is very likely that blank is lost because of decreased perioidal cells and atrophy. Would it be WBCs? pH, gastric acid, or intrinsic factor. If a patient has chronic gastritis, it is very likely that blank is lost because of decreased perioidal cells and atrophy. What do you think is lost from gastric, uh, from chronic gastritis? What do you guys think? Okay. Wow, 14 people chose gastric acid. The correct answer is intrinsic factor. So um, let's talk about this for a moment before we move on, guys. So intrinsic factor is needed to absorb vitamin B12. So let me take a step back. Let's look at this question. It says if a patient has chronic gastritis, so they've had gastritis for, it's not acute, they've had it more... They've had it for more than a couple of weeks, okay? They've got chronic gastritis. It's very likely that they'll lose intrinsic factor because of the decreased perioidal cells and atrophy. So the atrophy will cause a decreased perioidal cells, which are found where? In the stomach. Well, guess what? Without that, you don't have the intrinsic factor. You need intrinsic factor to do what? Absorb vitamin B12. Why is vitamin B12 needed? It's needed for the maturation of red blood cells and 
for um, neurologically, it helps avoid a whole bunch of neurological complications. You cannot live without B12, right? So if the patient um, has lost intrinsic factor. They cannot absorb vitamin B12. And I just told you that they cannot live without it. Guess what? Can that type of patient take uh, vitamin B12 um, supplements by mouth? No, because if they're taking it orally by mouth and they don't have periidal cells, they don't have intrinsic factor to absorb the vitamin B12. What's the point of taking it by mouth? It's going to do absolutely nothing. That type of patient by the way, um, what they're going to have, remember I told you it's important for the maturation of the RBCs. They're going to have what's known as pernicious anemia. I should do a video on pernicious anemia. I'm going to add that to my list. I'll make a video for you guys soon. But anyway, they're going to have pernicious anemia and they're going to have to get vitamin B12 injections every month. They're going to get it not by mouth. They're going to get it IM every single month. And let me tell you something, you cannot live without vitamin B12 and you will not live long. Okay. You have to get it. So you're going to be giving it IM every single month or patients going to have neurological complications until they, until they, all right. Okay. Was there anything else I want to tell you about this screen? I think that was it. Are you guys okay on the live? Okay. Let's keep going. True or false. Acute gastritis is usually diagnosed based on the patient's symptoms and a history of drug or alcohol use. Is it true or is it false? What do you guys think? True. True. You know, just from all of those signs and symptoms that we went over, and then on top of that, you look at the patient's history and you see their alcohol use or the type of medications that they're on. Usually they can be diagnosed just from um, that history of drug use, um, alcohol use, and their clinical manifestations. Last question. Of course, it's going to be a select all that applies. So if the patient is found to have H. pylori, what is expected triple drug therapy that would be ordered for this type of patient? Would it be a PPI, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, dexamethasone? This is a select all that applies. You have to choose three out of the four. If the patient has H. pylori, you expect triple drug therapy to be ordered for this type of patient. What's it going to be? Okay, well... I like that most of you guys chose the correct answer. I see 21 of you, though, chose dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is a type of corticosteroid. It's a steroid. We stay away from steroids. Steroids can cause what? Gastritis, right? So we don't want that. But yes, we expect a PPI to be ordered, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin. One more thing. I knew there was one more thing I wanted to say to you guys. Uh, the screen before when we were talking about the um, how normally a patient can be diagnosed by the clinical manifestations and their history, if they can't, there are diagnostic tests, like you can do a breath test on the patient, you can do, get a, a tissue sample on the patient to see if it's H. pylori, you can get blood sample, and that blood sample, they're going to test for antibodies to like intrinsic factor. So there are diagnostic tests as well, if the patient's clinical manifestations and history is not sufficient. So I wanted you guys to know that. And that is the end of this Kahoot. Let's see how you guys did.